Hello and welcome. My name is Sarah Yashua and I'm a Baltimore County Master Gardener. And I wanna thank you for joining me to talk about alternatives to turf grass lawns. Most people are at least a little familiar with the reasons for reducing lawn areas. But what we may not be aware of is just how far lawns have expanded in our country or how bad they are for the environment. It's very important that we recognize the costs of lawns and the benefits of reducing those areas so that we can set examples of healthy property management for our communities. Changing the mindset of a nation that is focused on fitting in is going to be a really slow process as we work to define a new normal, and it all starts with us. Master Gardeners is a University of Maryland Extension program under the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources that takes that science-based knowledge about good, healthy, sustainable gardening and landscape management practices and makes it available to everyone in the community through various outreach programs. Please visit our website if you're interested in learning some more about us. The topics that we'll talk about today are reasons for replacing turf grass, the strategies for reducing the negative impact of lawn maintenance, and what to plant in areas where turf grass has been removed. As we cover the techniques for replacing mowed areas, I'll give examples from the experiences on our property. This is how the front looked when we initially moved in 30 years ago. The only features out front were an exposed well pipe and several mature oaks and azaleas. Now, the ideas that we talk about today don't have to be accomplished exactly as we discuss them, nor do they need to be done all at once. In fact, most references recommend a modular approach, working on smaller, more manageable areas at any one time. First off, what is a lawn? Well, those open grasslands and climate of Scotland led to sports being played on wide stretches of flat green space, such as lawn bowling and golf back in the 1500s. Then in the 1600s, lawns originated in France and Britain as grassed enclosures within settlements that was used for the communal grazing of livestock. And this was to keep them distinctly different from the fields that were reserved for agriculture. This makes ecological sense because the moist mild climate of Europe supports open close cut grasslands. The low grass around a castle what made it easy to watch for people approaching. Although the lawns of the rich were, or the wealthy were more likely planted with chamomile or thyme. Now the immigrants from Northern Europe brought with them to North America, this idea of a lawn but the native grasses in the Northeast that they used for grazing were annuals. And what resulted was nothing but mud and starving livestock. So it didn't take long before the immigrants knew to bring their seeds with them to create their lawns here. Now in the 1800s, the US parks became public areas that were categorized by landscape lawns, trees, shrubbery, and water features such as ponds or lakes. And these were all features that were lifted from British estate grounds. Eventually, lawns migrated from the Civic Center into North America's backyard. And a key figure in this movement to residential lawns was Frederick Law Olmsted, who planned New York City's Central Park in the 1850s as well as parks in Boston and Montreal and many large cities at the time. Olmsted not only popularized the use of meadows in public areas, but he also designed suburbs in which each residential home sported a lawn. The Olmsted firm, firm designed Roland Park, Guildford and Homeland neighborhoods in Baltimore, among others. While lawn area could represent a great opportunity for wildlife habitat and sustainable ecosystem services, turf grass provides no food value or shelter for local wildlife and lacks biodiversity. The only thing you're feeding here are Japanese beetle grubs. Now, according to the EPA, nearly a third of all residential water use goes towards landscaping. And up to 50% of this is wasted from excessive watering and inefficient methods. This is an extremely expensive effort to grow a non-native species here. At over 40 million acres, 1.3 million acres in Maryland alone, turf grass is the US's largest irrigated crop. 
and it exceeds the irrigation water of our major crops combined. Of course, there are benefits to turf grass. Lawns are desired for children's play areas, for dog runs, for sporting activities, and for framing an entryway into a home or garden. Most of us grew up with lawns and we know how to take care of them. They're familiar to us. Plus, it's really easy to hire out the maintenance for their, a lawn. And lawns are considered socially acceptable. In most neighborhoods, you need a lawn to fit in. But the drawbacks of turf grass are many. Most lawn space goes largely unused. It is simply wasted space. Even in sunny, moist areas, lawns require constant maintenance in Maryland's climate. Fully 5% of air pollution in the US comes from lawn equipment. And according to a study by the EPA, there are over 120 million pieces of gas powered lawn equipment. And they estimate that hour for hour, a single gas powered lawnmower produces 11 times as much pollution as a new car. Those gas powered leaf blowers are not much better at eight times the carbon monoxide as a new car. California is considering a statewide ban on small gas powered machines. Many other cities already have bans in place. And the noise pollution disrupts wildlife and is the cause of many a neighborhood dispute. Lawn fertilizers and pesticides have proved toxic to birds and beneficial insects, and they don't stay put. They wash into watersheds affecting fish, amphibians, and our water supply. Unfortunately, residential lawns are often over fertilized, releasing 10 times more nitrogen than what comes from agricultural fields. The lawns increase stormwater runoff because those turf rats do turf roots do little to prevent soil erosion. And turf grass lawns are a monoculture of an introduced species. Lawns remove all available habitat for wildlife and all that we watering, weeding, mowing, and fertilizing is enormously expensive. Americans reportedly spend $40 billion and 3 billion man hours every year on lawn care. And here's the root of the problem. As you can see, turf grass has no substantial root system to hold the soil. And with such short roots, turf grasses are susceptible to drought damage easily. Now, other grasses and ground covers tend to have much deeper roots that hold the soil and enable access to water deeper down in the ground. This Sorgastrum newtons, or yellow Indian grass, is a Maryland native grass that has roots that extend down to over eight feet deep. Maryland is located in a climate transition zone, which is not favorable for growing lawns. Yes, you can grow both cool and warm season turf grasses in Maryland, but our state's climate is not favorable for either group of grasses over the entire year. This makes it a constant challenge to try and maintain a healthy lawn. If all or part of your landscape is heavily shaded trees or steeply sloped or poorly drained, then turf grass is simply not a good choice. And trying to grow a lawn where conditions are unsuitable often results in wasted money and frustration. As a monoculture, Turf grass areas are unnatural and they're susceptible to numerous problems in the best of conditions. There are several strategies to reduce lawn impact and the easiest way is to accept imperfections by eliminating fertilizers and chemicals, allowing the grass to go dormant in summer rather than watering and mow less frequently at a higher blade setting. This is what we started out with almost right away when we moved in. Weeds are normal and to be expected. Prior to the 1950s, white clover was actually included in lawn seed mixes because of its ability to fix nitrogen in the soil and serve as a natural nitrogen source. Mowing is still necessary and it needs to be done right. Mowing too low is a major cause of lawn deterioration. Now, if you have a large area of land, Consider a small lawn just close to your home where it's most often utilized. 
then leave the farther areas unmowed and it'll go through a natural stages of succession with one type of vegetation following another. First, it'll start with grasses and other herbaceous plants, followed by shrubs and tree seedlings, and finally mature trees. But you do still need to be prepared to manage those invasive plants. Low grow grass mixes are typically based on a blend of fescue grasses, some that clump and some that creep. And there are numerous other ways to replace or reduce lawn areas. You can use ground, cover, ground covers, which spread well, but they don't grow tall and they're low maintenance once established. You can create new flower beds or mask with mass groupings of native plants. If you have a cluster of trees or shrubs that you mow around, then create an island bed around them instead. Hardscapes include paths, walkways, patios, and decking. And these are the people places. This is where people go outdoors and to relax and enjoy. Water and garden features include ponds, fountains, statuary, fire pits, and playhouses for kids. And I only mention artificial turf because it is an available option to reduce mowing, but it's usually a petroleum product and it does not have the benefits of some of the other alternatives we'll talk about. We're gonna talk about each one of these in a little more detail. As we go through some of the techniques for replacing lawn areas, I'll give examples from my personal experience on our property. And while we have four and a quarter acres, most of the area is a heavily wooded forest on a steep slope. The about one half acre is yard area. It's within this orange outline that you see here. And even though we've reduced the mode area by about 50% over the years, that is still the outline of our yard. Not all of our techniques were by the book and surely some of them could have been done a lot more effectively and efficiently, but the overall effort to reduce mode area was successful. And from my experiences, I can give you some great tips on what not to do. The first step in replacing turf grass is to come up with a plan, decide what's important for you and then draw a map to fit that plan. You wanna keep lawn areas that are used frequently for entertainment or play or where the lawn frames a garden or structure. And then start to remove turf grass in areas that aren't used much. There's a lot of different web apps or web pages or apps that'll help you draw your map. But I found that a hand-drawn map works just as good and is much faster and easier. You wanna check with your city code or HOA restrictions before starting any project. It'll be easier to work within the regulations or maybe help them to um, remove detrimental requirements than it is to fight city hall once your project is complete. And the best way to resist weeds in a newly planted area is to thoroughly remove the existing lawn grass and weeds. Remain vigilant for the first year or two to keep new weeds from becoming established while any new plantings fill in. Now plant selection, site preparation, and following recommended procedures from the extension will help prevent many problems later on. Make certain that you are selecting the right plant for the right place in order to reduce your maintenance efforts later. And of course, there's gonna be ongoing maintenance. You already know how important it is to learn about your plants and how to maintain them correctly. There are several strategies to remove turf grass. You can dig it up. This works well as long as your lawn is mostly turf grass. But if you have deep rooted weeds, another approach might work better for you. For large areas, running a sod cutter can make really quick work of that grass removal. You can mulch it by laying down several layers of newspaper or one layer of overlapping pieces of unwaxed cardboard. Then you want to apply a four to eight inch layer of shredded leaves or grass clippings and then top that area off with two to four inches of compost. Or you could put down eight to 10 inches of wood chips. You can smother all the vegetation by covering the area with a reusable tarp, black plastic, or a weed barrier. But first you want to really close cut the area and thoroughly soak it. You leave the cover in place for six weeks to two months. Some places will tell you two months to three months and then apply a two to four inch layer of compost. Now this works best in a mostly sunny area. You can kill all the vegetation with herbicides and just a word about that agricultural vinegar. It's a 20% um, or greater acetic acid and it is an, an organic 
option. It works by burning the wax coating on the leaf, destroying those leaves. The vinegar works best on annuals because perennials are likely to grow new leaves and come back. So repeated applications of the vinegar are typical. With glyphosate, there's the same toxicity level as the vinegar, it's LD50. And when applied to growing plants, it's absorbed by the foliage, then translocated down to the roots where it blocks the production of a specific enzyme pathway needed for new growth. And it will kill most plants that it contacts. You can use a torch and burn all the vegetation to the ground. And this works especially good on annuals, killing the upper part of the plants. But again, those hardy perennials might well come back. And while tilling will destroy the plants you intend to remove, it will, also, it will also disrupt those essential microbes that are necessary for the health of any new plants that you put into the area. And it will also recharge those weed seeds that might have remained dormant. So other methods are preferred over tilling. We're gonna briefly go through some of the recommended plants for each of the categories that you see lift, listed here. But first I wanna give you a great tip from Dr. Sarah Vaya. She's the climatology professor at the University of Maryland. And she is um, a real proponent of using this paper sheet mulch to reduce weeds in a new planting area. It comes in rolls of 40 or 100 feet with various widths, usually three or four feet, but sometimes wider even. And you prepare the soil and your planting holes first. Then you cover it with this sheet paper mulch and cut out the holes to match where they are in the soil. And then you just plant your plugs or your potted plants right in those holes. Once the planting is completed, it is so easy to pull or cut the weeds that come up through the holes with your plants. And here's the results of Dr. Saravio's field trial and you can see it's it's just really lush it's all it's all the plants that are intended to be there and it was a fraction of the time weeding so these, this is a really great tool to use in your toolbox <laughs> low growth fescue grasses are cool season growth and should only be mowed in the spring and the fall with a minimum height of four inches Left unmowed, these grasses will lay down and form a soft, attractive mat of deep green. And while they will grow in part shade, like most grasses, they'll, they do better in some sun. The low growth fescue mixes usually include a variety for both full sun and shade. And you wanna look for a mix that has a blend of the bunch forming glasses, grasses. They're especially drought tolerant and they'll withstand heavier foot traffic along with the creeping fescues, which are gonna fill in around those bunch grasses to form a weed resistant sod. And be sure that any mix you purchase is marked for the transition zone. Most no-mow or low-grow mixes will work well here, except in hot drought, drought prone locations, such as south facing hillsides and very dry rocky soil. An echo lawn is simply a collection of plants that work together to give you a consistently lush foot friendly patch of green with less water, less work and little or no fertilizers. The key ingredients in most echo lawn mixes are that blend of drought tolerant fescue grasses and low growing clover. But the added nitrogen from the clover will also stimulate leaf growth and may increase the need for mowing to more than once or twice a year. Some blends also include low-growing herbs and tiny flowers. This bee lawn is designed by the Minnesota Bee Lab. It includes a mix of those low-growing fine fescue grasses along with self-heal, creeping thyme, and Dutch clover. There are over 200 species of native sedges in Maryland, and many work beautifully as lawn alternatives, especially in dry, shady locations. Other varieties have ornamental appearance and make great carefree plants in the garden. And just be sure to select the right species for your light and soil conditions. Many sedges are host plants to native butterflies and moths and the birds eat the seeds. Some recommended native sedges include the Carex pennsylvanica or the Pennsylvania sedge. It's non-invasive with creeping foliage that forms dense mats of medium green. It's got fine textured foliage growing six to eight inches on mode. And it will grow in part to full shade. 
we have the um, Carex Rosea, which is rosy sedge. It has narrow, fine textured leaves that grow in thick clumps in part sun to shade and may naturalize with short rhizomes. This sedge adapts to both dry and wet areas, including difficult dry shade locations. There's, there's the Carex Appalachica or Appalachian Sage. It's an attractive, fine textured, clump forming sedge characteristic of deciduous forests and forest edges with dry to average soil and part to full shade. And finally, we have the Carex Glaca, which is blue sedge. It's a handsome evergreen with dense clumps of this powdery blue green blades that spread by rhizomes and grow to a height of about six inches. Now it prefers medium to wet soil in full sun to part shade. Ground covers include vines, creeping and spreading perennials, deciduous or evergreens, succulents, mosses, and ferns. And the saying about ground covers is, the first year they sleep, the second year they creep, and the third year they leap. So keep in mind, you'll need to be extra diligent for the first year or two as the new ground covers become established with your weeding. Ground covers work especially well for steep slopes and narrow strips, but you probably want to use an edge barrier to contain spreading anywhere else. First off, please avoid those invasive species such as periwinkle, Japanese pachysandra, bugleweed, and English ivy. Unbelievably, these are still commercially available in our area. Some ground covers that are recommended for sun include the Chrysogonum virginiaeum, which is commonly called green and gold. It likes well-drained soil in sun to part shade and produces these yellow flowers from May to October. We have the Tiarella cordifolia or foam flower. This grows easily and spreads rapidly from sun to shade in moist soil. I planted it in dry, didn't work well. This is moist soil for these guys. There's the Pacara area or the golden ragwort. This really forms a thick spreading mat in sun or shade and sends up these really great stalks of bright yellow flowers in spring for our pollinators. I love this stuff. It's a real thug. You're going to want to have a way to um, contain it if you choose this plant. And finally, we have the Juniperus horizontalis or creeping juniper. This is an evergreen plant that provides that thick ground cover all year long. Now, junipers are most useful in full sun, especially where dryness is a problem. Ground covers for shade include the Pachysandra procumbens or the Allegheny Pachysandra. This is a native evergreen for moist soil in part to full shade, and it has white to pink flowers in early spring. There's the Heuchera americana or alum root. This is a semi evergreen native that might get this beautiful red veneration during cool weather. It does well in shade as well. My personal favorite is the Asarum canadense or called wild ginger. This prefers moist soil and deep shade. It's a great choice for a woodland or shade garden. And finally on the right, we have the Galtheria procumbens which is called wintergreen or tea berry. This is an understory plant in the blueberry family, and it's an evergreen plant with tiny white leaf flowers in May and scarlet berries in fall. And it forms this low mat of about six inches in height, has a really pleasant wintergreen scent when crushed. Now, rocky areas can be a really challenging. Some recommendations for those areas would be the Phlox subulata, or moss phlox. It's that low growing semi evergreen for sun to part shade, which produces that spectacular colorful mat in early spring. It's drought tolerant and is especially well suited for dry, sunny slopes or rock gardens. There's the sedum ternatum, which is stone crop. It's perfect for shaded rock outcrops and it'll do well in soil if the It'll do well in sun if the soil is moist enough. The stems of this succulent creep along the ground or over rocks forming dense mats. And for, to the right, we have my personal favorite, which is the Antonaria plantaginifolia or pussy toes. It's a native ground cover that does best planted in full sun in dry, well-drained rocky soil that doesn't have much organic matter. It forms a mat of soft woolly gray stems with their paddle shaped leaves and I love this stuff. It's a volunteer in my 
uh, along a stack rock wall. And um, it's in pretty much shade, but it is dry. That's, that's the important thing for pussy toes. Use native mosses and ferns for deep to part shade. And if you have moss in your lawn, it is a sure sign that the conditions are simply not favorable for turf grass. For a weak lawn with moss present, simply remove the grass by hand or chemically and let the moss take over. Glyphosate will kill the grass, but it doesn't typically damage the moss because mosses don't have a typical root structure. Now that agricultural vinegar will kill both. Most mosses do well in damp, shady sites and maybe the ideal plant under a large shade tree, such as an oak or a maple, but it might not hold up as well under a conifer. For accent foliage, select ferns that have large upright fronds from a crown, such as the cinnamon fern, the ostrich fern, or this Polysticum acrostochoides, which is the Christmas fern. Um, it has distinct fronds that stay green all winter. As with most ferns, it prefers shady, moist soil. With enough moisture, you can grow the sensitive fern, the Anoclea sensibilis, in full sun, and it'll crowd out most weeds, so they're really useful in massing in rain gardens and ditches and woodland edges or island beds. They're called sensitive fern because they're going to disappear at first frost. We have the maidenhair fern, the Adiatum pedatum. It has delicate fronds with dark, shiny stems, and their graceful fan-like pattern is really unique among our native ferns. The fronds arise from a creeping rootstock in clusters. And for a fast spreading fern with a lower height, you can choose that Eastern hay-scented fern, the Denstedia punctulobula. It has thrice cut and a really feathery appearance as it sways in the breeze. It also has the sweet scent of new mown hay when it crushed or dried or in autumn when it's going to rest. Um, it is a real spreader though, so you really are gonna wanna have some sort of barrier for keeping this one contained. Native grasses and ornamental grasses add stunning displays of texture, height, and growing habits. The ornamental grasses are low maintenance, they're drought resistant, they grow in most soils, they don't require fertilizer, they're deer resistant, and they have few pest problems. Who could ask for anything more? Just cut back the foliage each spring before the new growth starts. First off, Avoid the invasive grass species. If the label says Chinese or Japanese, leave it in the nursery. This includes like the Chinese silver grass, the micanthus, the fountain grasses, the hardy pompous grasses, and the Japanese blood grass. Please don't put them in the yard. They don't stay in your yard. Now, the University of Maryland Extension website has a great list of recommended native grass species, and they would include the Sargastrum newtons or yellow Indian grass. It's a tall native grass with that upright habit. The yellow orange plumes in fall provide that year round ornamental interest. We have the Schizocryum scoparium or a little blue stone. It's a steely blue in summer and red orange in fall, and it grows to about three feet tall, preferring dry soil. We have the Panicum virgatum, which is a large native switchgrass, and it can grow up to six feet tall. It grows easily in most soils and has some salt tolerance, so it's good for coastal areas. It's good for erosion control, but it does not tolerate shade well at all. We have the Des Champsia cespitosa or the tufted hair grass. This is shade and drought tolerance, so it's good for a woodland garden. We have the um, Sporobolus heterolepsis or prairie drop seed. This is a native grass that tolerates a wide variety of soil types with a height of about two to three feet tall. It gets these airy panicles, golden seed heads, and it serves as a great ground cover when planted in mass. And my personal favorite down in the lower right is the Aragrostis spectabilis or purple love grass. It's a low grass at only one to two feet with airy clouds of purple seeds. It prefers medium to dry soil moisture and is very drought tolerant. It's excellent when planting used along borders in mass plantings or for anchoring roadside slopes because it doesn't grow that tall. You wanna plant native perennials along with shrubs, trees, and grasses to create naturalistic gardens that reflect our region's unique beauty. 
for a greater impact and less maintenance, mass groupings of three to five species of perennials in new flower beds, different, fewer different species are easier to care for and more eye-catching than smaller numbers of many different species. Pollinator and wildlife gardens use a variety of flowering plants that bloom at different times throughout the season. They provide nectar and pollen, berries and seeds, and bird nesting sites. There's countless good choices of native plants to support our wildlife and several reliable sources for recommendations from the Extension, the Circe Society, the Pollinator Partnership, and the Maryland DNR, just to name a few. A rain garden may be suitable for in an area where you want to slow down rainwater runoff and increase water infiltration into your soil. You divert rainwater from roofs, driveways, and walkways to a low-lying area in your yard that you plant with native perennials and trees that enjoy moist soil and can tolerate some flooding. Plant a grass or gravel swale to move that water to the rain garden. And you want to replace turf grass by adding raised beds and grow some of your own vegetables, fruits, herbs, and maybe even a cut flower bed. Build your frames from wood, brick, or block to help minimize soil erosion and runoff from your garden. Here are some of the areas on my property that where turf grass has been removed, replaced by planted beds. We have a vegetable garden out back, which is about 350 feet that was established in a mostly sunny spot. Dean built a retaining wall to prevent erosion and then till the area after digging out the side. Now we don't till anymore. We frequently use that cardboard sheet mulching with shredded leaf cover. And we've had to adjust our planting over the years because the nearby trees as they matured now block most of the sun, but it still works great for garlic, carrot, beets, and herbs. There's a pollinator garden also in the back that started at about 600 square feet 23 years ago. Pretty sure about the date because Violet just graduated from college. It was initially planted with a typical wildflower seed mix that included the standard perennials and some annuals which did not reseed as advertised. It quickly expanded to almost 3,500 square feet. It's a huge area. And each year, it just seems a surprise as masses of a single species or two took off only to recede again in the next year or two. Until it finally settled down as a field of Monarda with some Echinacea, Phlox, and Rutabecchia still hanging in there. Yes, that Monarda is a thug. I only planted a single pot of one each of three different species. But the Monarda certainly had help. The deer ate pretty much everything else except the honeysuckle vine, the oriental bittersweet, and the um, still grass that just keep coming back. Unfortunately, with only one single straight narrow path between sections, maintenance in this area is a nightmare. It's next to impossible. And working on that steep slope is really difficult as well. Now out front, we have a shrub island that started out as an effort to hide that exposed well pipe, but it's been expanding every year thanks to my hoary uh -oh. knife. After losing several mature oaks, my deep shade out front suddenly had light. You could hear the wild ginger going, turn out the light. It's currently about 350 square feet and it's still growing. We use fallen branches for edging, which really just keeps the lawnmower out. And once the perimeter, perimeter is stable, we'll put in a more permanent defined edge and we'll remove those cages around all our tasty shrubs. Mass perennials and small tr shrubs with trees to create an island bed, but don't skip on the size. Bigger is better. Native shrubs will help give structure, wildlife shelter, and interest to your yard, and they help to draw the eye in to focus on that area. Remember planning and selecting the right mature size trees or shrubs for this for any areas. Native shrubs with high wildlife value include the high bush blueberry, the red strip stem dogwood, spice bush, the smooth sumacs, the native viburnums, and winterberry. Small trees for Maryland include wild crab apple, flower, flowering dogwood, American holly, pawpaw, eastern redbud, sassafras, serveberry, serviceberry, just to name a few. And many of these are going to do well in shady areas. 
The benefits of trees are numerous. Properly placed trees, once mature, can provide shade and reduce home energy costs, provide privacy, and add value to your property. Trees reduce air pollution, they store carbon, and they help control stormwater erosion. Trees are amazing. So replace turf grass surrounding a tree with two to four inches of mulch out to the drip line or plant ground covers under that tree. If you have space for one or more large trees, consider any native oak, any native cherry, any native maple, especially our native red maple. The Eastern red cedar is a good tree or tupelo are all really good trees for supporting wildlife. If you plant a black walnut, remember that it does produce toxins that are poisonous to many of the other broadleaf plants, but, so be careful what you plant under it. And for wet conditions, plant a river birch. Consider, again, consider the mature size of trees that you bring into your yard. Early on, we decided we wanted some privacy screening along the lane, and we selected our native eastern hemlock, which we love those trees. But we planted seven. They quickly reduced the mowing in that large area in the north yard. But as they matured, they are too dense for healthy growth. They also require constant monitoring and periodic treatment for the woolly adelgid pests. And two hemlocks would have been a much more appropriate number of tree, those trees in that area, and it would have accomplished pretty much the same cover. If planned, installed, and managed properly, meadows can contribute tremendously to naturalizing the American landscape, but they are expensive to establish, they take time to establish and maintain, and large projects frequently end up in disappointment. Meadows are large sunny areas composed of 50 to 70 percent native grasses with some flowering perennials adapted to the ecoregion and soil conditions. Now a pollinator meadow has 40% native grasses and 60% native forbs. Most meadows require less water and fertilizer than lawns do. They don't need mowing, but rarely. But for best results, you have to thoroughly prepare that soil before planting. For step-by-step -step instructions, you can visit the Marilyn Grows blog article by Dr. Sarah Tangren. If you have water coursing through your property, mowing up to the bank causes rapid erosion. Instead, stop mowing four to six feet out. You wanna use deep rooted perennial grasses to stabilize your stream banks. They'll filter the, and purify the rainwater runoff and they'll prevent the soil erosion. The Elemis virginicus or Virginia wild rye it does really well in shade and it's very attractive. This is a great plant to use to stabilize your stream banks. Hardscape is a term for non-plant material that goes into making the garden and is basically the living space for the people. This includes walkways, patios, walls, play spaces and the like. And these are the areas that invite people to step outside and explore and relax. Typical materials for hardscaping include stone, gravel, brick, pavers, concrete, tile, wood decking, and mulch. So when planning for patios, decks, and fire pits, estimate the size you want and then go bigger. Use permeable materials where possible and choose stone that's quarried locally. It'll look more natural and save money. If you're going to be doing uh, decking, then space the boards to allow water to drip through to the ground below rather than running off. We have quite a number of retaining walls and garden tiers on our property. We do live on hillside view and every one of them became a wonderful opportunity for a new planting area. We've also put in three patios that were areas that were mowed, the, but the paver patio that's out back is our favorite. This is where we spend almost all of our time outdoors. It has a retaining wall because it was built on a really steep slope. Unfortunately, it's also over a tree stump that is still decomposing and Dean's regularly out there pulling out the pavers and adding paver base each year. Now, once we put in grill furniture out there, you can see it's a little cramped. Have I mentioned yet to go bigger? 
Paths are more inviting than open lawn. So put paths where you want people to go. Generous paths in width and number. Lead visitors through the gardens. They also break up the planting beds into more easily managed sizes. You want to match the material to the path, like coarse bark is the perfect complement for a wooded garden, whereas gravel is going to have a more formal appearance. But don't use gravel where you need to shovel snow. Gently curving lines look most natural. For a modern look, use geometric, geometric shapes and straight lines. And you want to scale the path to the property, then make it a little wider to accommodate for plants as they grow. Generally, five to six feet for a walk to the front door and three to four feet for a side path. Paths that are used for a space is used only occasionally, like a compost bin maybe or a bird feeder. They could be a foot and a half to two feet wide. My best advice to you is to walk your paths daily and explore and enjoy them. We prefer mortared stone for paths on our property because it seems like everything wants to go downhill. But we've also used stepping stones, pavers, and wood chips. The best advice, again, is to decide how wide and then go wider. <laughs> there was a walk to the front door when Dean put in the stone walkway and it created this marvelous new planting area that currently has shrubs, perennials, and annuals. And as you can see, even without the plants growing over the sides, it should have been wider. The center picture is a stepping stone path along a river rock swale, channeling green water down from the roof to a rain garden. And just for fun, we put in steps leading down to our woodland paths. Water and garden features are an excellent way to create a unique appearance and focal point for your landscape. And water features can fit into almost any size space from a small fountain to a pond. And they generally use less water and are less work than the typical lawn. As a low maintenance alternative to lawn, simpler is better. Those naturalistic ponds that look like mother nature dropped them into your property are much more difficult to pull out than a simple design. And if your backyard becomes a lake after a rain, then divert the rain to a rain garden in the low area with a dry stream. And this is a rocky natural looking swale that's only wet when it rains and it captures the run, runoff and slows it down. We had a water feature when we moved in and it certainly did draw people into it for fun, but it was a lot of work and it used a lot of water. It did attract wildlife, although I'm not sure exactly how healthy it was for them. And this is how it looked most of the year. So my husband built a retaining wall and put in a frog pond for me. It attracts all sorts of wildlife. And this is where I spent all my relaxation time outside. I love this area and the serenade of the frogs in the springtime. So what happened to that huge space with the original water feature? Well, now it's a large greenhouse with lots of raised beds. Life is good at Hillside View. So things to consider when you're preparing to start a project. Explain to your neighbors what you're doing. If they understand, they're much more likely to accept the changes and they may even become interested in reducing some of their lawn area. You wanna keep neat borders and edges, especially in the public view. This is really important for acceptance within a neighborhood and it'll give that tidy look that shows that an area is intentional. You, again, check with your homeowner association and your city code regulations. The last thing you want to do is rip out all your hard work. You want to take modular approach for big projects, perhaps start with an area in the backyard and continue to monitor for invasive species. Remember that map of my yard when we started? Well, this is the current map that shows how mode areas have been the, reduced with lawn alternatives. But we're certainly not finished yet. We're currently working on replacing lawn area, the mowed area with low growth fescue grasses. And we're putting in several paths in that pollinator garden to create manageable spaces. There may be less blooming plants, but now I can actually increase more diversity and have blooms throughout the season rather than just when the minarda comes in. And I can get deer repellent to most of the areas. So that's good. And the next project is trying to remove, attempting to remove yet again, the Vinca invasia out in our front wooded area. So maybe the third time's a charm on that. 
Replacing turf grass is very important effort and your yard matters. To sum up, without too much trouble, replacing turf grass fosters a healthier watershed and ecosystem. It creates more interesting and enjoyable areas, supports local wildlife while reducing maintenance, water, and chemicals. And perhaps the most important point of all is that it helps to set the look of a new normal for the future. To wrap up this talk, I'd like to leave you with a quote from Dr. Sarah Vaya about working towards a sustainable landscape. Be enthusiastic, be persistent, and stay positive. So I hope you found some of this information interesting and helpful. For more information, please visit the University of Maryland Extension website. Thank you for your time.